Good morning, everyone. Hello. My name is Polly Sturgeon, and I am, my pronouns are she and her, and I am the outreach coordinator for the Indiana Geological and Water Survey. Today is December 16th of 2021, and I am excited to have you all joining me for our last Dig Deeper um, episode of this year. Um, if you are new to this program, Dig Deeper is a webinar series, a quarterly webinar series where we connect Indiana's geoscience research and careers to K-12 classrooms. Each webinar series is recorded. So this is a live program today, um, but it is being recorded and will later be posted to the IGWS YouTube page as well as our website. Um, in the posting to the YouTube page, we, I will be putting all of the relevant K-12 curriculum standards that align with this webinar, as well as links to other additional resources that you can use in your classroom. Today's webinar is best aligned with high school standards from the Indiana curriculum, but it can of course be adjusted to any age group. Um, while we're waiting for a few more people to join us, I'd love to see where people are calling in from today and joining us from today. So if you are here on the live webinar, go ahead and in the chat, either directly to me or to the group, put where you're calling in from. It looks like we have some people from Columbus, Indiana today. Hello. Some people from Gary, Indiana, up near the lake. We have a class of sixth grade students joining us from Bloomington. Wonderful. A couple others are hopping on. Thank you again so much for joining us. Um, if you are watching this recording later on after, after it's been um, recorded, then feel free to ask any questions in the comments of the YouTube page. You can also ask us questions on the survey's Facebook page or send us a direct email and our email address will be on YouTube and so um, the Facebook page and we will be happy to get back with you. If you are watching the live recording right now um, and you have questions throughout this session, you can go ahead and put them into the chat directly. Again, you can send them to the whole group or to me, um, and we will be sure to answer your question by the end of today's program. All right, we got a couple others joining on. Thank you very much for joining us for this episode of Dig Deeper. Um, today's episode is talking about topographic trail maps. This is a popular series of maps that the IGWS introduced a few years ago, and it was spearheaded by our now Assistant Director for Information Services, Matt Johnson. So I'd like to introduce you to Matt and have him take it away. Hey everyone. You guys are having a great day and thanks for joining us uh, for this talk. Uh, hopefully it'll be informative and uh, kind of uh, hopefully eye-opening for those of you who are younger that uh, didn't even know that you can have a career making maps. As I did not have a career uh, or know that that was a possibility until I was a, a sophomore actually in college. Uh, I always loved maps growing up, uh, but never knew I could actually make a career out of it. So hopefully this will inspire you. Uh, uh, at least to get out and hike, if not more. So uh, I'm gonna go ahead and start sharing my screen here with my PowerPoint and bear with me while I get, make sure the right screen is shared. And we will start the slideshow and all right. And I have my phone hooked up here so I can make sure that everything is looking correct. Uh, so, like I said, my, or, or Polly said, my name is Matt Johnson. Uh, I'm now the Assistant Director for Information uh, Services here at the survey. Uh, my title before was uh, Cartographic uh, Specialist and uh, Digital Archiving, or I guess Digital Archivist. So kind of taking projects and archiving them so that we could potentially, if we needed them later, or just to keep uh, the data uh, in a safe storage place uh, for users uh, down down the road. Uh, so let's jump in. Uh, first, 
a topographic map. What, what is a map, topographic map? Uh, we all see maps all the time now. The majority of our maps, we see them on our phones, uh, Google Maps, uh, various maps like that. Maybe we still see them in the classroom. I don't know if they still have the pull down maps that you used to have. Uh, I know I grew, grew up seeing, oh, here's the United States. Let's pull that map down or, oh, here's our world map. Let's find the places on this world map. Uh, so there's a variety of different maps, reference maps, topographic maps, chloropleth maps, uh, very simple hand-drawn maps. Uh, they're all maps uh, of some uh, form or fashion. Uh, but a topographic map is a special type of map. Uh, and here's a definition. A distinctive characteristic of a topographic map is the use of elevation contour lines to show the shape of the Earth's surface. So to show the hills, uh, the valleys, uh, the the rivers, the streams, the mountaintops, uh, their names. Uh, we can have names and uh, features of valleys and ridges on other maps, but these are specifically helpful on topographic maps uh, because you can really pick out uh, those features using those topographic lines. Uh, there's a lot of different types of topographic maps, different styles, different scales. Uh, here on the, uh, it would be, I guess, the, on the right, left side of your screen is uh, the topographic maps that the Swiss uh, cartographers put together. Uh, they make some of the most beautiful maps, uh, and they're topographic for their whole country, I believe at a scale of like one to 20,000, so very detailed uh, for the whole country of Switzerland. Uh, but here we can see some glaciers up here on the Matterhorn. Uh, you can see the contours uh, that really depict uh, the topography there in that very steep terrain. And then there on the left, on the right side, we see uh, a map of, this is the Great Bend uh, along the Arkansas River in Kansas, very flat. As you can see, the contour lines are there, uh, but they're very spread out. I'm, I think if I hold my control, you can see my mouse on my screen here. Uh, here's a contour, here's another contour. So they're very spread out here, as opposed to over here where we see these contours very close together especially when we get up here. These are just very tight contours. So one way in reading a contour map is if the contour lines are very close together, you're in a very steep area. So it could be a cliff. It could just be a very steep slope, depending on your contour interval. Uh, and over here, we can see this is a very flat area. So the contours are very far apart. And I believe on this map here, we're at 10 feet uh, is the elevation contour. So from here to here is only a 10 foot difference. Where over here on this map, I'm not exactly sure what the contour interval is. Uh, I don't have the skill uh, to tell me, but uh, much higher, probably 100 feet uh, contour interval here between these lines. So that gives you a very good sense of how steep some of these ridges and uh, cliffs are on this map. So <clears throat> obviously there's a lot of maps out there. They're already made, topographic maps. Uh, in very various forms. Uh, so why make topographic maps if they're already made? Uh, well, the first reason to make a map is because you love to make a map. <laughs> uh, that's, that's a great reason uh, for me, uh, at least. Uh, I like to make maps of areas to make things more useful for people and also just to make it more helpful for me. Uh, if I go backpacking, uh, Sometimes I do a winter backpacking trip in the Smokies. I'll actually make a topographic map that's just for me to use and for the group of people I go with so that we can say, hey, here's where we're going. We want to know what the terrain looks like. Uh, so I just like to make maps just for the fun of it. Uh, but also in this area uh, of Indiana, there were some needed updates of the maps. And our focus obviously was in the Charles Dean Wilderness for our first map. And this is about four years ago now, I believe, uh, when we created this first map. Uh, why, why, do, why are there updates needed? Well, there's new data available. Really, one of the most beneficial and helpful pieces of data for a topographic map is the digital elevation model. And this is a model of the actual terrain. So every point within this model, a little square pixel uh, in this newest data was about uh, five meters. So you know, uh, no, five meters, that's not correct, one meter. So three by three square. Uh, 
every point or every square that's three by three for the entire state of Indiana, we have an elevation value for that. Uh, recently, uh, this data has been updated to where it's almost a half a meter square, uh, much more high resolution data, uh, very helpful in creating the contours, seeing the topography. And we'll, we'll see some of that later uh, in the live demo uh, of actually what that data looks like and how it can be uh, changed and uh, enhanced to really show what we need to do. Another one is we want to increase our, our outreach mission. We want to really uh, inform the citizens of Indiana, uh, not only geology related items, but also topography related items and just our, our natural uh, uh, regions, our natural features that are actually in Indiana. A lot of people don't realize this part of Indiana is very hilly. There's a lot of steep slopes and uh, very challenging terrain. And having uh, maps that can allow people to go out and safely uh, traverse some of these areas where there actually are no trails uh, safely is, is very important. And we just want people to enjoy uh, the outdoors. Uh, and there again, encourage outdoor experiences and showcase what our services can be and, and what we can provide for the state uh, along with our geologic uh, focus. And uh, this isn't my first time uh, ever putting together topographic maps. Uh, I spent eight years out in Colorado at Trails Illustrated uh, working uh, for National Geographic, making uh, topographic uh, trail maps for all over the country and some even adventure series maps uh, across the world. So in uh, South America, well, not South America, Central America, uh, Panama, uh, Costa Rica, some adventure maps uh, down there. Uh, Unfortunately, I didn't get to travel there making the maps. Most of the data was digital, uh, but uh, still very fun to work on uh, maps for a variety of places. Uh, so yeah, I spent eight years in uh, Evergreen, Colorado doing trail maps. And my education background, I uh, went to Appalachian State University and received uh, a degree in geography with the concentration in geographic information systems. But my focus was on cartography. I spent uh, two years of interning uh, with a professor, Neil Lineback, at uh, Appalachian State, working on uh, a weekly article where I created little figures, uh, map figures for a newspaper article that he released uh, every week. Uh, so that was my first experience jumping into cartography. And like I said, I asked the question in that class, so Professor Lineback, uh, what kind of internship could I do? And he goes, well, you could make maps. And I was like, well, that sounds amazing. Uh, so I jumped in and, and started that software year uh, making maps and I've been doing maps ever since then. And that's been, I believe that was in 2005 when I started making maps. So I've been at it for a little while. But so my experience uh, really eight years there at uh, Trails Illustrated, I created the Hoosier National Forest map while I was there that covered this region, uh, not expecting to actually live where the map covered. Uh, so kind of an interesting uh, turn of events there. So uh, jumping into uh, the maps uh, that we, the first map we created, uh, like I said, there's maps available. So, so why make maps? Well, here are some examples of the maps for the Charles Dean Wilderness area uh, that are available. Uh, so we see one here from uh, the US Forest Service, uh, a pretty good map. It's got contours. Uh, we are missing numbers, so we don't really know what the elevation is here. Uh, we know there are 50 foot contours. Uh, but that really doesn't give us something that we would want to use, you know, if we're out on that trail and we want to, maybe we want to hike this ridge here, uh, but we want a detailed map to be able to do that. Uh, they do have some zoomed in versions of areas that are very helpful. Uh, and then also there's this Hoosier National Forest map that's out there. Uh, the scale on this map is a lot uh, smaller scale, meaning it's zoomed out. Uh, so you do not get the most detail uh, that you might want if you really want to do some off uh, trail hiking. Uh, some other maps that are available are uh, the USGS maps. Uh, so here uh, is the USGS map of the Charles Deem Wilderness Area. Uh, you can see these contours. They have their labels. Uh, again, here's really tight uh, spacing of our contours, meaning this is a very steep hill. This would probably wear you out going up. Uh, but then you level off uh, in some of these other areas where you're on top of ridges. Uh, this is the older version of the USGS topographic maps. Uh, they are updating these maps now. Uh, and this is 
a little older version. They've, they've cleaned these up some, but you can see this one's much more cartographically appealing. Uh, it's got more detail. Uh, you've got Frank Grubb Ridge is kind of labeled very nicely across this ridge. We're over here. We're not, what ridge is it really? I don't really, we know it's this compared to this map, but this isn't as pretty of a map now. Uh, hopefully they are working to update this so that the, the lines uh, are the actual text follow these ridges well, so you actually know what ridge you're hiking on. Uh, but still, usable maps, uh, but we wanted to take it, you know, a step farther to make it more usable. I wanted to zoom in on this one just so we could see a little more of the details. So they have their trails, access road, trailheads. Uh, here's Monroe Lake. This is 446, so if we keep going north on this road, this will take you into uh, around where the mall is. Uh, and target in that area of Bloomington. So this is still a good map. Uh, it's, it's usable out there in the field, um, but we wanted something that, that could be more usable and, and helpful. Uh, so with that, I'm gonna kind of transition into what the software I use to make the maps. Uh, but first I'd like to open it up for any questions uh, uh, at, this, at this moment. So I'm gonna, I'm going to mute for a second, take a take a sip of water, and then I'll let you guys uh, chime in with questions. You can either say them out loud or you can uh, type them into Polly, and I will uh, continue here in just a second. Okay, we do have a couple of questions that have come in to me, Matt. All right. Um, one person asks, um, you mentioned the digital elevation model had been updated, and that's one of the reasons you wanted to make these new trail maps. How is the digital elevation model updated? What does that mean to update it? Yes. So um, if we, if you think back on those uh, USGS topographic maps I was showing, those contour lines, back in uh, those who were created in the 60s and 70s, the, the lines were, and then digital elevation models were created from those contours at a 30 meter square interval. So, well, yeah, 30 meters. So we're talking 30 meters squares uh, for each elevation point in the state. Recently, starting in 2011, I guess that's not very recently now, that's 10 years ago, uh, but in 2011 to 2013, uh, a technology called LIDAR, light detection and ranging, uh, was flown for the entire state of Indiana. So what this is, is there's an airplane flying, it shoots a laser down, that laser bounces back up off of uh, the earth's surface or a building or a car driving down the road or a tree uh, and returns a signal to get an elevation value. This happens across the whole state, and we get this uh, data file called a, a point cloud or a LAS data set. So this is a data set of a spot on the ground with different values as that laser hit certain places. The benefit of this is this can be flown fairly quickly at a high resolution across the state. You can get in areas where there's forest, uh, as long as the leaves are off the trees, this laser will go down into, and I can show some examples of how this is very different uh, uh, in the live demo portions. Uh, but then this bounces back and can give you, you can get the tree altitude, you can also get a building altitude, you can also get the ground altitude. So very helpful in updating that. So we went from 30 meter to one meter to now a half a meter resolution or better in some places. Uh, that have been created. So that allows us to really create detailed contours and visualize that surface. Awesome, thank you, Matt. Um, two other questions and then we'll go back to the live share. How has the elevation accuracy improved over the past 50 years or so? Oh, wow, that's, that's a great question. Now, off the top of my head, I cannot think of what your plus or minus values are on uh, the older topographic maps. Uh, it was definitely high, I would say within, you know, 15 to 30 feet uh, was probably your, your estimate. It's probably a little bit better than that. Maybe, maybe five to 15 to 30 feet, depending on the area that you're looking. So if you're in a forested region, you're probably gonna have a little bit of a different value there. Uh, 
if you're in an open field, the values will be a lot better from the older data. But now resolution, at least on a, I know on the 2011, 2013 data, that is within 30 centimeters uh, is the vertical resolution uh, or plus or minus 30 centimeters. So that's that's pretty good. <laughs> uh, you know, not quite survey survey grade, uh, but for most use cases, this is a great, uh, great elevation uh, range uh, of, of error. Wonderful. So a lot more accuracy as technology has improved, it sounds exactly. like. Exactly. Um, and then one more question, and you might touch on this as you explain how you made the maps here coming up, but one person asked, how long does it take to usually make a topographic map? Uh, uh, well, uh, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I think it depends on the data availability that you have. Uh, if you have a lot of data and not a lot of processing, then you can quickly uh, get those maps put together uh, Pretty fast, especially if you've already got have your style figured out, your extents figured out. You know, I could probably put together a map uh, in two weeks uh, uh, for not a very large area if everything's available and I can move quickly. Uh, if I have to create a lot of data or get a lot of field work in, and a lot of field work is, I'll explain what digital field work is because I did a lot of that. Uh, you're you're talking three to four weeks, you know, almost a month probably to get a, a, a decent map together ready for a, a agency to look at to make sure I'm covering everything in there in your area. Thanks for explaining that. Yeah. All right, we'll go ahead and let you start sharing your screen again and tell us more about how you made these cool maps. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. So um, the software I use to create these maps, and we're gonna I'm gonna try to live demo this uh, so we can all see it and you can get a better understanding. Are, are you seeing my screen? Yes, I see it down there. Okay. Um, so uh, these first uh, this first row are GIS software. So this is Arc GIS Pro. Uh, this is Arc Map. This is this is really a program that's going away now. It's being replaced by this uh, program, Arc GIS Online. Uh, which is uh, kind of online uh, interactive maps. You can do a lot with that. And Collector, which now is called Field Maps, and that can be put on the phone for uh, field work, um, field verification and everything there. And then also, uh, then we move into the, the graphic design software. So RGS Pro has definitely moved a long ways in the GIS world of allowing you to make a cartographic product, uh, but there's still the publishing capabilities of a graphic design suite of software is very uh, beneficial in creating maps that we're going to print. So Adobe Illustrator, uh, InDesign, and Photoshop are our key uh, software for creating really a cartographic product that's going to be printed, uh, as uh, we'll look at. So then I, well, let's we'll see here. Why is it? There we go. Uh, so data use, uh, what, what map or what map data was used? Where did I get that data? Uh, did that data cost me anything? Uh, cost in a sense of maybe some hiking it cost, but the majority of data is free uh, for all of these maps. Uh, from the U.S. Forest Service, uh, their data is freely available from their website. Uh, the Indiana DNR, who hosts some of their data within Indiana Map. Uh, that's part of, uh, well, something that we take care of along in IJEC was a part of that as well. Uh, and the United States Geological Survey. So we can get really our hydrographic data, meaning our streams, our lakes. Um, uh, a couple that aren't mentioned on here are OpenStreetMap. I use that to verify some of the county data and get better classifications for roads uh, so that roads made sense on my maps and they weren't like highways going down through the middle of a forest that is a dirt road. Uh, we didn't want that happening. Uh, but a lot of this data is is out there. People can get it and process that data um, in, in any way they want to process that. So uh, this same process I use at National Geographic a lot of just connecting with uh, people at, at different agencies. So if you National Park, National Forest, State Park, State Forest to get that data uh, and bring that in. Uh, now, what you do with that data is 
kind of up to you, but then you have to have a style of your topographic map that you're looking to build. Uh, so uh, to kind of cover the maps that I have created so far, uh, and then we'll jump into really the process of making a map. Uh, so this is the coverage we have at the moment. Uh, so that first map right here, this TM01, that was the Dean Wilderness map. Uh, and then I received a grant through the Center for Rural Engagement where I built maps uh, really connecting uh, down here near Henryville. Uh, Borden is right here. This is the beginning of the Knobstone Trail. Uh, and the Knobstone Trail ends, officially ends here at Delaney uh, Park. Uh, with that's a part of a Salem or a Washington uh, County uh, park. And that's here. Uh, and then this moves into an area where uh, Star Hollow, uh, there's uh, Washington State Forest is in here. And then that connects into our National Forest map uh, with the Dean Wilderness here. And then we move into our Bloomington, Nashville, Brown County uh, map. And then connecting up to Martinsville, getting the rest of Morgan Monroe State Forest right up here, which is actually now called uh, Ravinia State Forest right uh, to the west of Martinsville. So these are the, the covers of each of the maps. These are all available through our bookstore. And I'm sure probably we'll put some links at the end where these can be accessible. Uh, and also on top of having physical copies, so, let me, uh, I don't know, let me stop sharing my screen for a second here when I find that spot to stop sharing my screen. I'll share my screen again here in a second. Hang on. I will go through this. Uh, so, back to this here, there's actually digital uh, maps available for free right now through another third party app called Avenza, and I will showcase that uh, from my phone here in, in, a, in a few minutes. So, the process. Uh, we're gonna determine needs. So what, what are the needs of the area? Uh, in my case, I saw, well, there's outdated maps. We have better topographic information. Uh, then I go and I evaluate what's available. So what maps are out there? What data is out there? Uh, then I'll determine my extent of my map area. So I'll look and say, oh, I want it to fit uh, in this size of a page. I want it to be a front and back map. So how's my layout gonna look? And then I start collecting, processing the data. Uh, if I have not, if this is the first time I've created this topographic series, I'll create styles and layers. Uh, then I'll apply those styles, labels, symbols, and then it gets edited and edited some more and then edited a little bit more so that we make sure we get it as close to perfect. No map is perfect. All maps are actually not really telling the truth. If we could go into a lot of details on how maps are really a representation uh, of the earth, they're not true because you can't take something round and make it flat and make it exactly what the earth uh, looks like. So that's a fun, that would be a fun quiz for everyone. Uh, are all maps, are any maps true? That question is, no, no map is actually true. Uh, you get them close and they're very useful, uh, but it's just kind of a joke I like to say. Uh, and then you, you edit again, you revise it, and then you send it off to the printer uh, and the printer puts that together, folds it, returns that back. Uh, and then you've got, you've got maps uh, to sell and to uh, uh, give out to uh, those uh, around uh, the state and who wants to uh, pick those up. So. What I'm going to focus on in our little live demo here is the processing the data, creating the styles and layers, um, applying um, those. And here, here's kind of a, a live demo of, of what we're going to look at. So we're going to look at shaded relief. So what we actually created from uh, that digital elevation model uh, are those elevation models, uh, contours, and then drawing a trail. Uh, this is be my digital uh, field work. And then graphic design, we're going to look at Illustrator and see how many layers go into making one of these maps? Uh, how do you how do I label something? Uh, and then the layout uh, in InDesign to make that final map. So I'm going to stop my screen share here and hopefully do it correctly for a second. Uh, everything is hidden. Here we go. This here. 
stop share. There, I found the button finally. Uh, so here are, you know, here are the copies of, I've got four of them here. Uh, they fold out very nicely um, to about this size. So we can see when we pull it out sideways, front and back. Uh, Let's put into one here, so I'll pull this up kind of close. You can see Bloomington kind of over there. Uh, but uh, let's let's di let's dive into to some live demo here. I'm going to check the time. Oh, good, we're we're, we're right on time. Um, I'm going to start sharing my screen again, and this this is going to be the fun part and see how technology treats us today. Uh, so. Here is ArcGIS Pro. Uh, oh, I'm not sharing my screen yet. There we go. Now, now we're back up and running. So here's ArcGIS Pro, and here are uh, here's the map I was just showing you. Here's Bloomington. Uh, you can see some of the styles in here look pretty good. We can zoom in, zoom around, and over here are all the data that goes into making this one map. So. I will not walk through every piece of this. Some of this is uh, trails that uh, actually some of the citizens of Indiana hiked for me and provided those for me during COVID when I could not get out into the field. Uh, and a lot of this is data that goes into putting the maps together. But right now we're looking at our base map, our roads. Uh, but the first thing we want to look at is our contours. So I'm going to turn our contours on here for the east side of the map. We're going to move over to the Brown County area. So here is Nashville is right here in this area. So if we zoom in, we're gonna see all these contours up here in Brown County State Park. And here we see, oh, here's a nice area where we have a flat, flat top up on a hill. And then these are going down. This is, a, this is going down into a valley. Here's a stream. And anytime you look at a contour map, anytime a V is facing uphill, this, uh, this means that this is uphill, a V facing, V, the bottom of the V faces up the hill and the top is going down. So that's a very generalized way to read, read a topographic map. Now, a lot of people have a hard time seeing the 3D aspect of this. I can look at this and really see this in 3D without any, any help. I've looked at maps long enough to where I can just visually know this is going downhill, this is the top of the hill, and here's going down the other side of the hill. But the digital elevation model allows us to actually see this with the shading. So I'm gonna turn the shading on here. Now we can really see how this is the top of a hill kind of flat, and then here's going off each side. Now this data is exaggerated, so we can actually really see the topography well. Uh, it's not this extreme here in Indiana, uh, but there are some steep hills over there in Brown County. Another thing we can do is actually with this elevation data is we can put a kind of a, a process on it called curvature. And this is showing us uh, just some enhanced versions of the data which is gonna bring out certain features. You can really see all these little ravines popping out. And we combine that with the hill shade, we can actually visually see a lot of features on the landscape that you normally would not be able to see. So very, very helpful. Uh, and that's where we get into this idea of digital field work. So let me turn on the original trail data that was provided to me. Oh. Turn this one here. Oh, that's the wrong one. We want to see this one. So these red lines are the original trail data. So these were either uh, probably someone used a GPS and they, they hiked these trails, uh, but you're out in the woods and we know Indiana is not open to the sky. So there's lots of trees depending on the GPS quality. Uh, these lines are, you know, they're close, but if we look at the topography here, that we have visualized, we see the same line following this, this contour here. Well, that's the actual trail. This little line here is the trail. And we can see that this trail is not actually hitting the trail. 
So my digital field work, instead of having to go out, or if I wasn't available to go out and hike a trail to get the line work, I would use this as my tool to digitize the line. So I have my new lines here. So for instance, here we can see this switchback actually went farther to the south than the original data showed, because I could see that within uh, the shaded relief. So if I turn this off and on, we can kind of see can see those features really popping out. For the major majority of the areas, uh, I was able to update the trails this way. In other areas, you couldn't see this and you actually had to go out in the field or go with the original data if time did not allow to get out in the field. So this is really Brown County, uh, a lot of fun things here, a lot of mountain biking, uh, a lot of hiking uh, that one can do there, uh, but Hopefully uh, these maps are gonna provide more accessibility in that, those areas. So that is uh, the GIS side of things. So once, once I'm happy, I've processed my data, uh, I'm happy with um, where my lines are sitting, um, where my roads are, at least for the most part where my roads are, I will then do an export of this data. I'm turning a few things off so that we can uh, see just the roads, okay. this layer, and then I'll turn my contours back on. And this data will get exported uh, out of the software into an Illustrator file. And Illustrator is where the final major cleanup does happen uh, to actually make the maps pretty. Um, so we do an export. I'm gonna minimize this here. I don't have that uh, particular uh, sample uh, available at the moment of that area, but we can look at one of the other exports uh, that comes into Illustrator. So here we are in Illustrator, and this is what the map looks like that I start with. So we can see the road names here. I'm going to zoom in a little closer. This is the last map TM05, which covered uh, up to Paragon. Here's the White River, and you can see, you know, it looks pretty good. It, it would be a usable map here. Uh, but what are we, we're missing something. We're missing our contours, we're missing our shading. We really need to bring that data in. Uh, so the first process we did, we export our roads, our trails, uh, et cetera. And then we export our shaded relief. And I'm not sure how visible this first layer is. I'm gonna zoom in really close so we hopefully can see that. This is that curvature layer that I was showing earlier. This has been stylized, kind of a brown color. I don't know if that comes through on the screen. Uh, but then we start building the pieces of our background. So now with our curvature layer, we turn on our hill shade, which is the shaded relief that starts giving us that 3D look. So I'm gonna zoom out a little bit. Now we're starting to see the hills. Uh, here's a big uh, outwash valley. Uh, actually, that's not an Owlish Valley. That's the valley of uh, Salt Creek going into uh, Lake Monroe down here. I thought we were still up in Martinsville. Uh, but here is the causeway. So if you've driven 446, here's the causeway going, going south across the lake here. And then our next step with the shading is we want to we give that visual sense of elevation change. So we have a, what we call a, a ramp that a color ramp that goes from green, greens and blues up to kind of browns and yellows to show lower elevation versus higher elevation. And that all gets combined in, into this file here. And then we apply a few uh, graphic design techniques of, of curves to brighten things up. And you can kind of see how that changes it to not be so dull and uh, it looks kind of flat and gray, kind of like it does outside today. We're gonna brighten it up uh, so that it looks nice. So once this is done, we can see here's the whole uh, um, area of this part of the map. We can zoom in over here and, you know, here's some, some quarries here in southern Bloomington. Here's Leonard Springs area, if you've ever hiked over there. And you can also see, it, this looks like maybe there's a problem with this. But no, these are actually sinkholes. Every one of these little dots are sinkholes. And I'll, if I have a minute at the end, I'll show you uh, really the advantage uh, the, the new digital elevation models have given us with that. So once we've created our shaded relief and we're happy with that, 
we'll move that into our Illustrator file for that map. So here's the same area into Illustrator. And then we have layers. So here are the layers that make this map up. And I don't know how, if that's visible there, but there are a lot of layers. So these are sub layers. So kind of a header group. So if I open up this stroke layer, you will see there are lots of layers that go into this map. So we have park boundaries, we have the streams, we have the trails, we have the roads, and all these stack on top of each other to create the map. So I'm going to show you how that looks as we build this map. And I'm going to zoom into an area here. Let's see, where do we want to, where do we want to go? I kind of like right around here around Lake Lemon. Uh, nope, not Lake Lemon, Yellowwood Lake. Uh, so right here is the lake. And as we build this out, so for a topographic map, we need contours. So let's turn our contour layer on. Here's our lines. We can see, oh, here's the top of the hill. Uh, that's nice. Let's turn our lakes and our boundaries of the forest on here. And now we're going to turn on some UTM lines. So these are blue lines that show help with navigation. They're our, our coordinate system. Uh, and then let's turn our strokes on. This are our are trails. They're different colors based on uh, what the use is. And then here are our roads. Here's our these are little pullouts along the road. Um, and then our symbols. So we need symbols to tell us what's there. So we have various symbols that go on a map. And then, well, we can't have a map symbols without some text to tell us what these things are. Uh, so now we have some trail names. We have the mileages between each intersections of our trails, uh, camping areas, boat ramp. Uh, uh, there's a little bench out there you can take a, a sit on. There's a really nice one on the top of this hill on High King Hill. I recommend going there and just hanging out for a while because it's a really steep climb, but a very beautiful view from up here, especially in the fall. As you look north, you can see the lake. Uh, very nice. And then a couple other things are some different items for the edge. So we want to mask out some of this information. We want to have our coordinate system, our neat line, and our UTM numbers to show up, kind of finalize that map. So now we've built our map. A lot goes into that. I, I'm just turning layers on, but it's not that easy. Uh, for instance, I have to go through and make sure these labels look nice. So I'll move a label around. Or if I like this label flowing along this hollow, this allows me to change the shape. So I could move this guy and make it really weird, which wouldn't be really what we would want to do. But this gives the ability to really manipulate our road stream names, uh, any other names that we need to add on here. So what this is finished, uh, this goes into InDesign, and I do not believe I have that open, uh, and I'm not going to take the time to open that right now, but this file goes in there, and then we put our text, our cover, uh, and then our map's ready to go uh, one first to the editor uh, out to the agencies, and once they've finished everything and they have give me a thumbs up, uh, we'll move it to uh, the publishing process. Uh, so that's creating uh, creating a map, uh, a topographic map series uh, here at the survey. Uh, I do quickly want to show, uh, I'm going to move this, oop, that's the right one, over here and show just briefly here what uh, this LIDAR data has provided, uh, this new data. And there's a great area right over here near Cars Farm Park where we can see just the amount of resolution change that we have we have gained. So if we go in here, we go to our reference layer, we're going to turn on our LIDAR hill shade. Uh, and then we're also going to change our base map to be just a hill shade in the background. And within our layers, what we can do is we are going to change our transparency here. So within this area, we can see, uh, I think we're doing Leonard Springs here, probably a really great spot. This is the data from the 30 meter DEM. 
uh, you can see it's not not the greatest. Let me try another one of these. It's got kind of there we go. Uh, you can see there's 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 some valleys here. There's really some steep terrain. But if we go back and look at our lidar compared to this, we can see that difference that the lidar provides. We can really see the features uh, coming more visible, especially in wooded areas. So if we go back and we turn on just an imagery here, turn on right here, bring this down. Now, within this area here, we can see there's a lot of trees. And our old data would, would not have been able to collect any information in there. But if we turn our LIDAR on, we can start seeing, oh, look, there's sinkholes in here, there's sinkholes over here. So you can see some of that maybe we could see here, but this data really ups the ability to do all types of analysis. So, and this is freely available for anyone to, to play around with on Indiana map. Uh, you can turn that layer on and zoom around and look, find your house and see, uh, see what you can see in, the, in those locations. So that's probably uh, a lot to take in, uh, but I'm happy to answer any questions uh, or uh, explain things further if, if needed. Awesome. Thank you so much, Matt. There's really a lot that goes into those topographic trail maps. And I know I really enjoyed listening to you explain all of the different parts and pieces of the, the, the puzzle that you had to put together. Um, I do have a couple of questions that have come in since the last last break. And again, if you have any questions um, for those watching the live program, you can go ahead and put those into the chat, either as a direct message to me or to the whole group. And if you were watching this as a recording later on, you can put those as comments in the YouTube page or on the Facebook page, and we will be sure to answer them. Okay, a couple of questions have come in. Um, one person said that your maps look really pretty. Do you have any art background? Not in the sense, of, well, I guess I took one like, photographic or no it was a it's a fine arts class in college uh one one class to kind of complement some of the ideas and the color uh that um uh, is involved with putting maps together but no formal training really uh a lot of playing around as a kid drawing things i was always drawing things and, and things like that but no no uh formal art training but there's definitely a side of the cartography is the art and science of uh, map making. Uh, so I do really enjoy being able to take very complex scientific uh, ideas and analysis and making them into a more artistic representation that you can understand both as a scientist, but also as a non-scientist where you appreciate the art of it, but you also know that there's actually science behind the art. So. Awesome. Thank you. Okay, another question kind of related to that art interface. Um, one person wa just wanted to double check, you add all of the color ramps and the hill shades in Photoshop and Illustrator, correct? Not in the pro software. Yeah, for these maps, yes. Uh, moving forward, I am I'm actually moving to do all of some of that work within ArcGIS Pro hoping to really harness it as the cartographic workflow uh, to take steps out. Uh, so I'm not doing as much in Illustrator Photoshop. The, the reason Illustrator Photoshop gets used, there's some a little more control still, uh, especially if I'm going to print, uh, I can control the color space, meaning I need to go to an offset printer and print in CMYK, cyan, uh, magenta, yellow, and black. And I can control that within Photoshop and Illustrator a lot better than within Pro, uh, just from my background. Uh, but I've been learning how to really set that up in Pro um, here recently. Okay, thank you. Um, you were scrolling through and showing us all of the different layers that you had to use to create one of these maps, something that 
you know, I, as someone who doesn't, is not a cartographer, would never have known there were so many layers involved. Did you have to create any of those layers? And if so, what is one of those? Well, yeah, so the crea creation of a layer. Yeah. So if you think about it, the roads, the streams and things like that, probably some of the creation was in the samples I showed of the trails where I had to redraw the trails. Uh, so those are places where either the trail was way off or and I was not happy with where it was landing, or I actually went out and found additional trails that were marked on the ground that were not within the system that I, or not within the data set I was provided. So I had to actually create that layer. So I either hiked it, brought it back, and then lined it up with what I was seeing uh, on the topography, or um, um, took that piece and created a new layer out of it, which was a new trail layer. So every, really every piece on there is, is, a, is a, a stacked layer to create it. Uh, and each of those do have to be created manually sometimes of like, oh, that shouldn't be in a roads layer, that should be in the trails layer. So you're moving layers around uh, throughout the whole process. Um, one person asked a question of, is there, are there any plans to release the Knobstone Trail as one single map? Uh, well, the Clark, the Clark State Forest one covers, uh, on front and back of that one, actually covers the whole Knobstone, the official Knobstone Trail, uh, meaning the one that begins at uh, Dean Lake and ends at Delaney Park. Uh, now, there, there are sections of the Knobstone Trail that they're not officially can be called the Knobstone Trail, but there's sections of Pioneer Trail, and then there's the Tecumseh Trail. Those all connect in some form or fashion uh, from Dean Lake to Martinsville or near Martinsville. Um, putting them all together, I don't know if we'll put them together in one map because it would be an awful big map at that scale. Uh, but maybe as things move forward, maybe in a, a, a smaller handout or booklet that, that walks along that trail. So I know the Appalachian Trail, I know a lot of other uh, trails out there have little booklets that really focus just along the path. Uh, that is a possibility where we could release uh, maybe some a little booklet that does that. Okay, that really lines up with the next question I was going to ask you. You mentioned scale a couple of times, and in the beginning of the program, you gave an example of a scale like one to 20,000. Can you explain what that, that means? What is a scale on a map, and what is that number? Yep, that's a great question. So uh, the scale is pretty much your, your resolution. So are you zoomed in really close? That would be a large scale map. Sounds kind of odd, large scale, but smaller area. Or, or if you zoom way out where you see the whole world, that is a small scale map, but a larger area. So that's the way you, it's, it's very confusing for a lot of people because they're like, oh yeah, I'm gonna look at this really large, large scale map. And they're looking at the map of the world. It's like, no, that's not a large scale map. That's a small scale, meaning one inch on that map is probably thousands of miles or hundreds of miles. Where on a large scale map, for example, on my uh, trail, trail maps here, one inch is a half a mile, meaning if you look at the map and you see one inch on there, that means in real world, that is a half a mile. So one colon 36, three, let's see here, I can't remember it off the top of my head. Uh, yeah, now you asked me the question and I just blanked on what the scale of these maps were. They're one inch to half a mile. It's so 63, 360 would be one inch to a mile. So there's 63,360 inches in one mile. So if I had a map that was one to 63, 360, one inch on that map would represent one mile. So that's a good way to kind of think about that. Uh, the fun part of making maps is you learn all these weird conversions, and so I know that 663,360 is a mile in inches, 5,280 is how many feet are in a mile, and then I know that uh, 3.2808 is, is how many feet are in one meter. So you just get all these numbers in your head, and they just go everywhere, but it's kind of fun. 
uh, and you learn all these conversion processes. So that's kind of scale. Uh, so larger scale for hiking, really detailed. Like if you're going to go orienteering, trying to find your way around the woods, you definitely want a large scale map. If you want just a general overview of an area, you want a small scale map. Like the bedrock maps that we have, where it shows the geology of the whole state. That's, I think, one to 500,000 scale. Yes. Is that right? So the bigger the number, the one to the other number, the bigger that number is, the more zoomed out. Is that exactly. correct? Okay. Um, neat. Very good. Okay. Another question. Do you ever use Google Earth as a tool? Yeah, I've used Google Earth definitely uh, as a tool but in, in the past and, and really on these maps, I would I would actually have people would provide me KML files uh, for areas that I had questions about and I would bring those into Google Earth. Uh, a lot of times use that to say, OK, well, that looks pretty good. Let me bring that data now over into uh, my GIS software. So Google Earth is definitely helpful. Um, aerial imagery is very helpful. Uh, in some cases where I could just trace roads from aerial imagery uh, where there was no road data available. So yeah, definitely tools like that are very helpful. Okay, we're getting close to the end of our time, but we have two more questions unless okay. anybody adds another one to the chat. Um, one question, How this is from a student. Um, I believe the student is in either middle or high school. How can I learn GIS? Ah, that's a great question. So there are some opportunities out there uh, where definitely schools can uh, get the ARC GIS license for free uh, and they can start implementing uh, that into some of their workflows. Mm -hmm. One of the easiest would be ARC GIS online where uh, a school could sign up for that. And then you could actually have people uh, make maps of their backyard. Uh, you know, or maybe you live on a farm and you want to kind of make a map of each of your buildings. Uh, so that would be something that you could really get into. And I could look for some links for Poly to provide to uh, connect into some educational resources from ArcGIS that would be able to provide that. And we would also be willing to uh, set something up or maybe we could uh, partner together. Uh, I know I've come to, I believe it was Templeton many years ago where I sat down and and actually had brought iPads and we went out into the uh, playground there and plotted some points and came back in and tried to look at them on, on the computer. Uh, things, technology has gotten better since then. So maybe that's something we could look into doing again uh, for, for different schools. That would be really fun. I will be sure to add some resources to the recording um, in the, the description there. Okay, one last question, Matt. And this is sort of a fun one. What is your favorite kind of map? <laughs> oh, man, that's a great question. Um, favorite kind of map? I think any map that, that brings a sense of adventure uh, to what I'm looking at. So it could be a topographic map like we've been looking at. It could be a hand-drawn map from someone from the past who actually had real artistic skill and was able to draw the topography and you get a sense of really being in that space by just looking at the map. So any map that really makes that sense of adventure real, uh, seem real at least uh, to me. I think one, one thing that uh, you know I've thought about a lot with my experience and what really drew me to map making was probably, uh, those road trips with that Ram McNally Atlas sitting in, in the back seat where I would just pull that thing out and be like, where's the green on the map? That's where we want to go because those are the pretty areas, meaning those were national parks, those were national forests, those were in the mountains usually. Uh, nowadays, you don't really see the road atlas anymore. Uh, I went into a store once and said, hey, where are your road atlases? And they looked at me like, what are you talking about? We don't even know what that is. A road atlas? They're like, use your phone. I'm like, you can't get the you can't get the context with your phone. You need that physical that physical piece. So, uh, that again, it's a sense of adventure. Where can I go? Where can I end up? What can I find? Well, that is a wonderful answer and an end to a really wonderful program. I know I enjoyed hearing about 
how you make maps and learning more about those. Um, I, and I think our audience did as well. So I will be sure to add a lot of resources to the recording of this program. Again, if you have any further questions, add them to the, the uh, comments or feel free to email us, contact us on social media. Thank you all very much for joining us and we hope you to all. see you at the next Dig Deeper episode. Have a good day. See ya.